Hey, I have a real treat for you. On this episode, we have Hayley Andrews from Dudley uh, in the West Midlands, and she's built an enormous property portfolio, but ranges from a huge amount of experience, not only from your buy to let, so HMOs, commercial conversions, listed buildings, shopping centers, car parks, schools. She's got a huge range of experience. She shares not only her inspiring journey and also what she's doing to help women in the space in property, and also what she's been doing in the Property Elevator Show, which is the Hit Sky TV series. So enjoy the podcast. Let's get started. People in property get a bad reputation yes. and people are afraid to say, you know, I'm a landlord or I'm a developer. And the reason they are is because of the bad reputation, but also the um, stigma that's associated to it. You're just rich. That's just how people mm. perceive it. Well, I came from nothing. Yes. I've built my wealth. It doesn't matter yes. whether it's property, whether it's a, a corner shop, whether it's a gym, uh, whether it's an online business. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't make money, then you're not a business. Um, so on paper, we were asset rich mm. um, and we didn't realize that we were cash poor until my husband got very poorly okay. um, uh, and he had to have brain surgery, he had a, a bleed on his brain and other issues as well. And obviously all of the complications that come with that. Mm. And we lost his income overnight. Hayley, I know you've purchased some unusual properties, but purchasing a museum and buying it cheaper than what the other offers were made on it, and still making money from it. How, how does that work? Uh, it all comes down to relationships. Um, everything I do is a commercial decision. It's about driving the price down uh, to what suits you as an investor um, and ultimately making money. So with a, a building like that, um, are you going to carry on running it as a museum? It's, is it something for the community? Because you said it needs to make money. So I'm guessing it probably wasn't being run too well, which is why they've sold it in the first place. <laughs> no, so this is a building that I um, I used to go to as a child. Okay. Um, so I love history. Um, and I've taken my son there over the years, right up to the week it closed um, right. uh, 10, 12 years ago. Okay. And I'd always said to my husband that I'd love to have this property in my portfolio. So it is very much a passion project for me. Mm -hmm. um, however, everything is a commercial decision and I do make money out of it. One of the problems with the museum was it had a covenant on there to state it could yeah. only be used as a museum. Right. And of course, we needed to get planning permission to, to do what we wanted to do with it. Um, but we wanted to retain it for the public. And um, so we did a feasibility report. We went out to the public. We found out what they were looking for, what was missing from the area. Um, and we actually purchased it as part of three other, sorry, two other, so three three buildings in total, um, which would become an entertainment quarter. Right. So uh, the museum has now the covenant removed, um, which was a legal nightmare. And of course, it takes time. Yes. Um, so you've got to be in it for the long run. We exchanged subject to planning permission as well. Yeah. So there was a risk there. Um, we got planning permission for use class E. It's just under 15,000 square feet, okay. um, this particular building in isolation. And it will become uh, cricket sixes, inflatination, escape right. rooms, indoor food hut. Yes. Um, but it will form part of the entertainment quarter because we've purchased the old um, fire station. Okay. Uh, which is across the road. So it's yeah. all in kind of like one section of, yeah. of the town. Um, uh, and um, that is a turnkey bar and restaurant. Okay. And then the offices adjacent to that we're converting and now have planning to do a hotel, a boutique hotel. Right. So there's probably uh, a lot of complications in trying to do a deal like that. And many investors would run a mile. What is it about these more complex deals, which I know you enjoy doing? What is it about these that appeal to you, the really challenging, complex type of deals? I must just be crazy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, if you can buy rights, you can make money. And if there's problems, most people will walk away from them. Yes. So I tend to search for the problems, uh, look for properties and problems that most people would walk away from yes. and then I look at how can I solve that problem. Yeah. And that's ultimately where I make the, the the bulk of the money that I make and yeah. the businesses that I do as a result of my success to be able to solve the problems where most people don't think that they're, they're able or capable to do yeah. that. I think that's a great learning. After we talk about uh, when you're buying something, you're getting a very good price, there may be a, a problem with the property or there might be a problem that the seller is facing, mm -hmm. usually one of those two. The question really is, is the problem fixable and at yeah. what cost yes. to make it viable? And it surprised me most people don't consider that. 
they're, they're just looking for, is it cheap? Can they just add value? Whereas actually, when you scratch below the surface, that's where the real opportunities come. And that's where you can get very creative in how you put the deal together. So for example, having a covenant and it can only be used for museum. For most people, that's a no-go and they're, they're running a mile. Yeah. How did you manage to, because that you purchased from the local authority. Yes. How did you manage it so they accepted your offer, which is much lower than the other offers that were being made on that particular site? So my view uh, with this property was the combined purchase of all three. All mm. were sold by a local authority um, so and owned by local authority. I knew the history of one of the buildings because um, my architect had actually worked on it with grant funding through yeah. Heritage. Right. Um, and I sit on several uh, heritage trusts as well so um, I'd worked on the building I know the building really well I yeah. knew that it had had over a million pounds worth of uh, grant funding um, to restore yeah. that particular building but there were actually quite a few people sniffing around that building because it was a turnkey um, uh, uh, a turnkey business basically yeah. With a tenant in situ signed, uh, you know, a ten-year lease, um, uh, paying forty-five thousand pounds a year. Right. Um, so I actually paid market value for that one, mm -hmm. uh, but there were other people that were were uh, actually put higher offers in, yes. and the council tried to negotiate with me. Um, but my argument and why I won the deals uh, and managed to buy all three. Um, was because it was a proposal for the regeneration of that particular area. Right. And my proposal was very much a business plan to bring footfall, employment and regeneration to that area, which would then service local businesses and the local community. And so it was more about the plan that I had mm -hmm. with the other two buildings, which were problem properties. Right. As you'll probably see myself and Hayley, we've both had enormous amounts of benefit from networking and meeting other people, which is why we both run property networking events. And what I'd like to do is invite you to our networking event, which is in Birmingham on the third Tuesday of every month. We have up to 200 people for you to connect and network with. And we have some great speakers sharing their knowledge. Hayley was a guest previously. And also sometimes I'm sharing my knowledge and experience as well. So what we'll do, we'll put a link in here for you, just on the screen for you to register and look forward to seeing you at the next event. Um, uh, and then I got this one kind of thrown in yes. with it as a result. Um, but I had to be quite hard uh, with the negotiation. I went in uh, to uh, the um, a meeting with local authority and uh, other people that were present with my solicitor and surveyor and and uh, and um, architect and uh, kind of put this plan on the table and said yes. it's all three or none at all yeah. and while you do have people that are prepared to pay you x amount of money for it their plan isn't in line with what you want this to be yes. and they're also not bringing a four million pound spend to uh, the area regenerating and obviously um, building employment as well so yeah. um, it was uh, kind of like a throw a grenade in <laughs> and see what happens but I was fully prepared to walk away I know yeah what value that I had and, 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 and was adding. I knew that what proposal I was putting forward was very much in line with the town's plan and, and you know, and what they wanted from the locally from a private investment and also elsewhere. Um, so I knew that I'd got a good solid argument um, and uh, it's about knowing what you can pay for something. Uh, and I'm, you know, I am very hard negotiator and it yes. was it was all three at the price I wanted or none at all, uh, which would have lost a, a lot of private investment for yeah. the local community. We're but I'm heavily invested in that area. So I had the right. confidence to be able to say and the relationships yes. locally, because I've been investing in that particular area for 15 years um, to to be able to have the confidence to turn around and and say i'm heavily invested this is very much what i want to do it's in my interest as well as yours and this is the proposal that i bring to the table we yeah. take it or leave it it's really understanding what they want or what they need yes. out of this yeah. and not all of that is driven just by the highest possible price which is maybe the approach some other people may have taken I think uh, that's the, that. Yeah, I think that's what most people will do is they'll kind of be tunnel visioned and, and, and you know, they're focusing on HMOs or they're focusing on service mm. accommodation or they're focusing on commercial to residential, for example. And most people, and I've got to admit, actually, when I first looked at the museum, I did actually look at the viability for a commercial to residential conversion yeah, because yeah. there are houses on the back right. in a courtyard. Um, and um, 
And, and when you look at the front, it looks like there's windows that have been kind of bricked up. Okay. And I thought, do you know what? The history sure of the then. building, it's because it was, you know, they used to get window tax on each window. They've been right. blocked up. We can go back on the history, open up all of these windows and have uh, either serviced accommodation or, or, yes. or, or residential conversion, which would have lent itself really well. Um, However, it wasn't. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 we, we look back over the history and, and, and windows was a huge issue with okay. this building. So um, while it was a lot of property um, and, um, you know, the price per square foot to convert to residential in comparison to what you were purchasing at made sense from mm -hmm. a financial um, decision, um, it wasn't viable and they wouldn't have allowed it. Right. Um, so it was more about this is a listed building as well. Yes. And um, so, you know, we're not doing anything under PD here. Yes. Um, uh, and actually someone listed it partway through me purchasing it as well. Really? Oh, yeah. wow. So from the initial conversation, it's like three years yes. to me actually owning the property and getting planning permi permission in place. So it's right. not for the faint hearted. It took a long yes. time to get to that point. Um, but I'm very much in it for the long run. Um, I understand, obviously, um, uh, the, the business, the model, the area. Um, I know exactly what product I'm putting back to the market. I've got people lined up to obviously take on that property as well. Um, so I have choice. And I yes. think that's all I ever try to do. Yes. Solve problems to give me choice. Yes. And then I get to See, see see what else to do really so like a challenge like it being listed part way through a purchase uh many people consider listings something that's happened many years ago but they can happen at any any time yeah, so if someone you, feels that there's a need for that property to be listed yeah so um part way through the purchase um uh somebody had put put in uh, to get the property listed. It right. should have been listed. Yeah. You know, if I, I, I actually do genuinely love listed buildings. I restore lots of listed yes. buildings. Um, it is a passion of mine. Yes, I make money out of it, but I'm very good at that. And I work with problem properties and grant funding to be able to restore these back to their original um, former glory. Yes. And I get a great deal of satisfaction from doing those types of projects. Um, so, you know, it, it I'm a specialist in that area mm. or would be classed as a specialist yes. in that area. I have all of the correct people in place to deliver any project like that. And I've been working with them for a very long time. And so while it wasn't a problem for me, it could have been a problem for someone that Somebody perhaps else. didn't know, um, yes. uh, you know, much about how to handle a listed building or, you know, the process and, and obviously the pitfalls, yes. insurance and, you know, marketability. Everything is different for a listed building um, because you are dealing with a different animal and it can be or seen as a negative thing. Yes. Um, but if you can pick out the positives and minimize your risk with the negatives um, and you know what you're doing, um, it actually did me a favor um, because listed buildings is my specialist, what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, uh, a listed building that is empty uh, doesn't fetch business rates. Right. So <laughs> thank that's, you very much, whoever did well. that. <laughs> so I always say karma's the ultimate bitch and uh, they, uh, whoever thought that they were kind yes. of put in, throwing the spanner in the works and causing issues actually did me a favour. And your intention is to restore the building yes. uh, anyway. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, um, and this is why they work with me because I'm very sympathetic with the building, the history. I understand the history. I research the history. I work with the current layout. I have the team's in place to restore and bring these buildings back into you know yes. public use or, or alternative use and I do that very successfully. Mm. There's a huge difference between a renovation and a restoration there is. and I guess that's the the fear many people have over listed buildings and they they run a mile as soon as they hear the word listing yeah but as you said there's huge opportunities what what do you think are some of the benefits of getting involved in a listed building that maybe people haven't considered? Well, you own a part of history, so there's a sense of pride there, I think. Um, I don't know whether that's just because I'm a historical freak, but, uh, you know, British people love history. Yes. You know, um, we, we value history, we value the, you know, old buildings, and, and I, I think you do own a piece of something that is unique. 
um, and will always be unique. Yes. It's not the same as buildings now today mm. where, you know, you have every other building that's the same. And um, they're likely still to be around in hundreds of years from yeah, now. Well, in that's current, another positive, format. I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah. they've, they've stood yeah. the test of time. Yeah. They're still standing. They're solid, good, solid structures, uh, beautiful, stunning buildings. They are unique. Um, there are benefits from grant funding and also, you know, heritage days and things like that, open the properties up to the public. There's funding that's available to you there as an owner as well. Um, so there's lots of grant funding and, and financial incentives available to those that are restoring listed buildings. Yes. Uh, obviously, it depends what, what building it is, what the listing is and things like that, and what area, et cetera, you're in. Um, so that's not a given. Um, but... Um, yeah, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, the reason I, yes, I love history, but, but the reason I started looking at these types of problems was because there was less competition. Yes. Which allowed me to negotiate yes. and drive the prices down and buy at what mm. I needed to buy because I was in the residential realm and commercial realm and, um, you know, the, more and more competition is coming in all of yes. the time and, and, and you can move the price bracket, um, but then you're in a more professional price mm. bracket, you're changing the market, you're changing the demand, the speed that you have to work at is obviously much at a higher level and and, yes. and much more professional arena. Um, so I was finding it hard to negotiate and buy at the price I needed to buy. Um, so I thought, well, how do I control that? Mm. Uh, you know, how do I compete with people um, if we're all competing for the same projects yes. and ultimately you know lots of new people coming into the industry as well that were driving the prices up and not perhaps knowing what they were doing right mm. then and then <laughs> I don't mean that disrespectfully yes. we all start somewhere but um, amateur investors pushing up the price um, are paying too much which were making them unviable and yes. um, so I very much started focusing on white elephants, development sites, projects that have been, you know, planning lapsed or refused and then listed buildings and, and covenants, enforcement notices and all things like that. There was less competition there. So if I increase the price and reduce the competition, yes, and the price bracket in terms of purchase and the sizes of the buildings, it took out majority of the competition. Yes. So I was able to buy better. And when you are getting involved in a project like that, and like the one you mentioned, it took three years to, to complete, it can be quite easy to get emotionally involved and emotionally attached to that project because you've invested so much time and energy and probably money as well at that stage. How do you, how do you stay detached emotionally from a project like that? And um, so there is an emotional connection with a, with a project like that. Uh, as I said, that that particular one, I, I you know, I'd, I wanted to own yes. from a child. You know, yes. that, that was a building that I've loved and admired pretty much most of my life. Yes. Um, so that particular one does have an emotional attachment. However, you don't let the emotions get the better of you no. because you still said you'd be prepared to walk away from it if the deal Always. wasn't right. Yeah. yeah. Um, at the end of the day, you've got to have the confidence to know what you want and what you need from a project. Mm -hmm. um, and emotion doesn't come into it mm -hmm. at all. So while there was an emotional connection, that's completely left aside. It's yes. always a commercial decision. I'm in this business to make money. Yes. Um, and ultimately, that is the focus. While I will, of course, restore a beautiful building, there's passion behind that. I'll bring employment to the area, help with the regeneration and continue to build my wealth within that area. Um, I, 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 you know, I am doing other things that's, you know, is satisfying me as an individual. It's not just about money, but ultimately it is a commercial decision. I am a business and I am and always will make the decision based off the bottom line. And you, you're not shy about uh, talking about making money from no. property. And most people involved in property investing are primarily there because the money it can make and the wealth that yeah. you can create from that. Why do you think people are a little bit shy and squeamish <laughs> about talking about making money and, and find lots of reasons they're doing it other than the fact that it's making money? I think it's just society as we know it. And it's very British um, way to behave. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, people in property get a bad reputation yes. and people are afraid to say, you know, I'm a landlord or I'm a developer. And the reason they are is because of the bad reputation, but also the um, stigma that's associated to it. You're just rich. That's mm. just how people mm. perceive it. Well, I came from nothing. Yes. I've built my wealth. 
you know, I've worked very hard to do that. I've committed time. I've been super dedicated. I, you know, I got educated. I've sacrificed a hell of a lot to get to where I am today, to have the choices that I have and the wealth yes. that I have. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people um, just assume that if you're in property, you come from money. Mm. And that's not true at all. In fact, probably... 80% of the people that come yes. across my door have created their own wealth, mm. uh, you know, come from uh, a council estate yes. or from uh, a family without money. And, um, you know, a, a building, making choices that are improving their financial situation and also leaving a legacy for future generations. Yes. You know, that's a choice we make. Yes. Um, so I have no problem with telling people that I'm in this business for making money. I do lots of other things as well. You yeah. know, I, I, I give to charities. I give time, which is, you know, most valuable most commodity valuable we have. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and I do a lot of good. Um, but I do that because I'm able to do that mm. because I make money. Yes. Without the money, the money is a byproduct which allows us to have choice and do what we want to do. Never be afraid of admitting that you're in the business to make money. I mean, ultimately, that is that is what business is about. It doesn't matter yes. whether it's property, whether it's a, a corner shop, whether it's a gym, uh, whether it's an online business. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't make money, then you're not a business. Yes. I said you've not come from money or wealth as a background. So tell me about how you got started uh, uh, in property. You've been doing this some time. Yes. Yeah. So I've been doing it for 22 years now. Um, I'd love to give you an inspirational story. However, I don't really have one. Um, I was an accidental landlord. Um, so um, I've always been a bit of a rebel, always been outspoken and um, super employable, got the education and the, the grades and that behind me, but never really liked staying anywhere longer than a year or so. Yeah. Um, uh, so got bored very easily, always wanting to be challenged. And, and, you know, as soon as I got what I needed from yeah. that particular employment employee, I'd, you know, I'd move on. That's yes. it. You know, so it was more about the experience yeah. growing me as an individual and then moving to the next one and the next one. So originally when I first started out, um, I come from nothing. Um, uh, so I'm not, you know, a flashy person. I'm very good at, you know, I'm very good with money as well. Um, uh, so I would save, I save the deposit money, purchase my own home. And then when I moved in with my husband, um, uh, I kept the house rather than sell it because yes. you never know what you know, yeah. what's going to happen. <laughs> I mean, I met my husband at 16, <laughs> but <laughs> but you never know. Um, and I obviously didn't, and he's still my husband today, yes. might I add, um, but you never know. I'm so a super independent person. Um, and I, I was hooked from there, really. So I became an accidental landlord. Um, um, and I kept, you know, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be staying anywhere very long and, and that I needed to do something for myself. And property was kind of my pension plan. Um, so I saved up the deposit money, purchased another one, another one, another one. And I just continued doing that. This um, was mostly uh, residential buy to lets you were yes, doing at the time. Yes, this was, okay. you know, this was all residential. It was just buy to lets um, when I first started out. I didn't even know what a HMO was. I hadn't had any education or anything like that. My long term plan really uh, when I first started out was to buy a portfolio. Um, with you know the, the the money that I was saving and earning, Set the deposits, yeah, uh, yeah, purchase a property, start yeah. saving again, do the next one, yeah. okay. And I was doing that really well because, as I said, you know, I I don't live a flashy lifestyle, I don't waste money, I'm, I'm very good with money, um, so I was able to do that. I was mortgageable, I got good income, so with my husband as well. Um, so on paper, we were asset rich mm. um, and we didn't realize that we were cash poor until my husband got very poorly. Okay. Um, uh, and he had to have brain surgery, he had a, a bleed on his brain and other issues as well. And obviously all of the complications that come with that. Mm. And we lost his income overnight. Um, he was a self-employed Oracle developer. Okay. So he was on £100,000 plus a year. Yes. But he was self-employed. And because we so were so working, young. no income. No. Yeah. If it's not working, it's no income. And, and I didn't realise that was the same for me either. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we thought we'd made it. We've got this buy-to-let portfolio. We're both on super good income. We've got a really nice house. We're driving nice cars. Um, you know, um, when we thought we we were great. Yes. You know, we were untouchable. Yes. <laughs> um, but we were only as good as our next paycheck. Mm -hmm. We didn't realise that. 
um, until we wasn't able to work. Um, of course, he couldn't work. Uh, I had to take care of him. Uh, so we've pretty much lost our, our income overnight. Yes. And while we own this portfolio, uh, we, we'd never looked at cash flow or anything like that mm. because we were happy with the income we were receiving. We were only looking at the assets and yeah, so holding them long term. So you were more investing yeah. for the long term to yes. create equity. That would the yeah. the idea was that this would be a nice nest egg for us in the future. In the future, and when we you, decided to retire. You yes, know. You use those magic words of uh, uh, asset rich and cash poor, yes. which people don't really think about sometimes. No, Millions right. of pounds of property, but there might be very little cash flow. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was the situation we found ourselves in and um, more of a distraction, I guess, but also, um, you know, a means to an end to be able to start saying, well, OK, property is what we want to do. Um, but how are people making money out mm. of property? You know, we own all this property yet, you know, we're in a position now where we don't have really enough income off yes. the properties. So what are people doing that we don't know about? And that's when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and that kind of like dropped the, the cookie. And I was like, oh, that's how you do it. It's the book that is a, a game changer for many people. I many think, people yeah. you meet have started with that book or a very similar book to, to open the mindset uh, about what's possible. And it just amazes me. My experience, always I've always worked for myself, essentially a few yeah. little stinches of kind of working uh, for someone, but predominantly always work for myself. And the idea always being that actually, if I'm not working, no one else is going to put food on the table. Yeah, I've got to go out and kind of do what we need to do. Uh, but when someone gets involved in a kind of corporate lifestyle environment, uh, breaking out of that can be very, very difficult. So that that's a great book. So how long ago was that when you first come across um, the, uh, so the book? So I, I did the buy to lets for a, a, a good three or four years. Okay. And then it was after that. So okay. um, we're talking you know, what, 2000 and, well, I started in 2002, so 2004, okay. five, yeah. okay. I would say. Um, so I read that book. Um, we did the US training. They do a okay. mentorship yes. program. Um, um, and then we realized, you know, we, we started looking at HMOs and things like that. We learned about lease options and all yes. of those types of but creative stuff. the principles stuff. are the same uh, in, the, in the States, although the practicals might be slightly different. Well, but we the overall principles are the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we realized that we started doing them. We were like, well, nobody understands what this means. Yes. <laughs> um, so then we did the UK version, right? Um, uh, which um, was, it, it, it wasn't, it was under a rich, dad brand but it wasn't rich dad poor dad training right. as such okay. it was a, a a license someone that had yeah. their license um so that's how the connection came about right um and within our first year of doing the training we did 15 hmos oh wow yeah so wow. we we grew very quickly so as soon as really we knew how to do it yeah yeah and i think having a portfolio already mm -hmm. um uh gave me credibility yes so yes it might have been easier some confidence as well that you yeah. understand the basics well uh, i mean i i didn't i never purchased wrong um but i didn't necessarily purchase right um okay. so we reconfigured the the portfolio that we had obviously you know put them on the right mortgages and things like that um and uh that released some capital we paid for our training and things like that um, and then we looked at obviously raising finance through angel investors. I was yeah. super investable as well. People were confident in me because I had experience, track, experience record. Yes. track record and also a personal guarantee that I could offer that yes. held, you know, I got equity within a portfolio. Um, uh, so people were confident to invest in me. I had no problem in uh, raising finance at all. Mm. Um, and um, we just grew from there, really. Um, we started doing rent to rent as well, um, which is not something I'd ever heard about before, really, uh, until I did any training. Um, and I hadn't really heard about it during the training. It was lease options back then, right. okay. um, you know, but you didn't have yes. the you don't have the option to purchase yes. with a, a rent to rent model. Um, and the reason we started doing rent to rent is while we were able to raise the finance, there was no issue there. We were super mortgageable as well. There was no issue with that. We got our portfolio. Um, so um, uh, we got no problem in raising the finance. We couldn't turn the properties around quick enough. Okay. Um, and I landed a contract with uh, a recruitment company for the NHS. Right. Um, so they were bringing uh, people over from uh, Europe and they were providing accommodation as preferred okay. accommodation and also employment in the NHS. Right. Um, so this contract was UK wide. 
Um, so uh, all of a sudden I'd got this contract that I could, uh, yeah, huge demand and couldn't, couldn't even if, even though I could raise the finance, couldn't yeah. turn the projects around quick enough to, okay. to, to get them in a position to rent them out. And um, so I started then networking, finding landlords and saying, oh, I've got this contract. And that's where yes. Rent to Rent was born. I mean, I'm sure it already existed, mm. um, but I didn't know about it. It yes, was kind of you. just, yes. a, you know, uh, solving the problem. Um, so we built the Rent to Rent portfolio. Um, and uh, then when cash flow really wasn't an issue, we started then looking at different types of projects. Um, you know, when cash flow isn't an issue and you've got good solid income, whatever that is, it doesn't matter. Um, it gives you choice. Yes. So, so that's... The, the HMOs started generating the cash flow for yes. you, yeah. but then that took care of regular income coming in yeah. in order for you to start thinking about, okay how can we grow this as a business yes yeah absolutely and one of the biggest mistakes i did make because we grew so quickly mm -hmm. um was um i didn't understand the business side of it yes. i was gonna ask there must have been a huge number of challenges yes. in doing that yeah. many properties in such a short space of time well well Even not for an experienced person that's quite a challenge yeah. well i, I mean i self-managed the buy to let portfolio alongside my job so i don't okay. class that side as my investment journey because yes. anybody can buy property if they've got they can save the deposit money yes. up and they could get a mortgage um so i never really class that as the professional side um but um i self-managed um so in the beginning i kind of thought well okay the hmo portfolio i'll self-manage it mm -hmm. so you know we want to improve our cash flow we can do that by saving 15 yes. percent on management fees or 10 to 15 percent on management fees and uh and it's a no-brainer but it was a huge mistake, right? Huge mistake, and I would never self-manage uh, uh, ever again. Um, so, um, what were some of the learnings in that? Well, I was on call twenty-four hours a day, mm -hmm. seven days a week. If someone's toilet was broken, it was me that yes. was being called out. If the police had gone out, or an alarm had gone off, or yes someone had stole someone's milk from the fridge you were a social worker yes. you were a security guard <laughs> yeah. you were a cleaner a plumber you know it, it, you i became everything yes. and um while i think that that did help me in terms of you know the people i employ today and and the people that work within my business and with me it, it did give me a massive level of respect for everyone that's involved yes. because not only did i you know find the deal create the relationship negotiate the deal do the schedule of works do the project management um find uh the tenant or the buyer you know i was i was completely uh, you know it was me um you know uh, and then manage it off the back end as yes. well um but i think there's a huge amount of learning for especially people in the early stages to do that yes because yeah. there's so much you you learn and as you said it helps create the the respect and understanding of if somebody else is doing what uh, you know what we come to expect from them yeah I don't regret um, uh, you know being a jack of all trades and doing all of those as I said it, 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 you know I understand every single role um, and I'm I never regret anything I think everything happens for a reason yes. and we are the people we are today for the experiences that we go through and and uh, the life that we have uh, is as a result of the life that we've had mm. um, so I'm I never look back and regret anything um, but I would do it differently um, so if if I, when I have people come through now while I do think that there was massive benefits out of me doing everything and it, and it did give me a level of understanding and respect for every single role within my business um, it also um, took me away from my the things that I should have been focusing mm. on which was creating the relationships yes. negotiating the deals and, and perhaps project management yeah. as well which those I latter enjoyed. things are really working on the business where the earlier things exactly. were working in the business yeah. Yeah. and when we get stuck in the business it's very difficult to grow and I I think I was at about 60 ish tenants when I was in that trap yeah and I just couldn't see how I could get yeah. out of that yeah. to stop managing and running these because yeah. well if I hire somebody else now I have to forego some cash flow now I need more properties to pay for them yeah exactly it's, it's a vicious stuck in that cycle yeah yeah so I always say no um you know for anyone that's coming through um start as you mean to go on so even if your intention is to do that still forecast what it will cost and yes, cost it the into the deal and processes, yeah. yes the systems and processes and automation is is massive. Yes. And do that now before you actually start. Yes. And and people are oh, they want to get they want to yes. buy the deal. <laughs> they want to do the deal. But actually having the systems and the processes and the people behind those systems um, and a, a good, solid process for people to be able to follow. It's not just about putting a system in place. It's got to be 
a solid system that anybody can pick up. You know, I have operational um, uh, uh, documents for all of my businesses and you or anybody else, doesn't yes. matter if your experience level can step into my business, any one of them and run that business yes. on a day to day basis. Solid foundation. Solid. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have that when I started out. So we kind of we grew so quickly. Yeah. We didn't look at the systems and the business side of it. We were just focused on next property, next property, getting it sorted, getting it tenanted yeah. and, and, and the day to day management of that. And obviously all of the the roles and responsibilities that come with that as well. Um, and then we were kind of like, we, we've left a job, created an even harder job. Yes. This was about freedom of time and we have no time. You know, we are trapped. Yes. So then we had to kind of say, well, money's no longer an issue. So we need to now look at the business, go back to the beginning, systemize it all, bring yes. people in to run it for us, and then go out and focus on what, what we are good at, which yes. is negotiating the deal and, and getting good, solid relationships. And how did it evolve then from the HMO? So you, you did all these HMOs that created the cash flow. What did you then move into or transition to next with uh, along your property journey? Well, first of all, larger HMOs. Yeah. <laughs> because well, once the, you get into HMOs, you, when you uh, enjoy the cash flow, it is addictive. Yeah, it is. It is definitely addictive. Um, so um, I I built a rent, basically. So I, I, I okay. buy to rent, build to rent. I tend to keep. Um, so uh, while I will trade property predominantly, that's my model. Um, I do genuinely believe that the real wealth in property is holding property long term yeah. and history tells us that. Um, so again, history freak, data freak, I'm very much interested in all of that side of it. So um, I I knew that I still wanted to um, you know add to my portfolio and and retain those assets, um, but I get bored very easily. Mm. So the smaller residential stuff was kind of like okay, I know that yes. I you know I can do it inside out. There's nothing I I feel uncomfortable with. I'm confident that I can do that and just keep doing it. There's there's uh, you know I need to challenge myself. And um, so it it came about when money's not an issue, you can then start. You can then start challenging yourself, mm. and and of course the way you view risk is differently as well. Um, so then I was prepared, uh, or or started looking at larger commercial buildings, converting them into cluster flats and things like that. Okay. Um, so you factories into 21, 22 bed HMOs, basement flats, and and right. all of those weird and wonderful things. Um, you know your banks into serviced accommodation and uh, and also commercial asset management as well. So commercially multiple occupation, um, or just taking a commercial vacant building and um, you know doing it up and putting a good solid tenant in there yes. uh, uh, and retaining that asset and recycling your capital that way. So for somebody that may not understand what you mean by commercial asset management, do you want to uh, explain how you uh, force up the value of something? So a commercial asset is um, uh, valued based on uh, a local yield basically, but the income that that building generates. Yes. Um, so if you're buying uh, you know, a rundown commercial empty building, you're buying much cheaper price per square foot. So by actually doing a renovation to that building, making it fit for purpose, but protecting your downside by having a good solid tenant, uh, you know, with a good balance sheet, good turnover, um, putting them in there improves the value of the asset by improving the income the property generates. Yes. And similar to HMOs, you've started doing multiple commercial yes. tenants within, yeah. a, within a building. Yes. Yeah. So commercially multiple occupation. So yeah. um, commercial has changed massively over the last 10 years and, uh, you you know, you 20 year leases and even 10 year leases, you know, are very few and far yeah. between now. Um, that's not how businesses operate. They want the flexibility yeah. um, and they want the freedom to move and, and choose what they want to do as a business. So they don't want the burden of a long term um, tenancy. Yes. Um, so um, we recognised that that you know the 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 model was changing. So we looked at well, okay, it won't fetch a you know a next or a, a, a Lloyd's Bank or whatever yes. because it, that's not the model that they're following anymore. But what it will do is uh, you know bring in uh, the local bakery or yes. the local you know some these smaller local businesses that perhaps are not such great covenants, but actually reduce your risk yes. because the same with a HMO if you have six rooms 
in a property, if you have one room voyage, you still mm. have five rooms paying you yes. rent. Um, so that's the same with commercial. You're de-risking it, yes. Yeah, de-risking it as much as you possibly can. And I think more and more lenders are on board with that now. And they recognize that the model has changed. Um, you know, you put uh, Joe Bloggs in a commercial unit 10 years ago and it would be downvalued as a result of it. You yes. know, uh, Whereas now they are recognizing that the, the way businesses occupy the commercial buildings are different and they do want that flexibility. Well, most businesses are small businesses in the country anyway. Yes. The vast majority are smaller yeah. businesses. Yeah. So it's highly likely your, your tenants are more likely to be a small yeah. mom and pop type business. Yeah. And have you found the, the the kind of commercial world of property different for residential? Because we've always only done residential. And um, I'm fascinated by commercial, never really got involved, only because we've been preoccupied with what we've been doing. Yep. Um, how have you found it different from uh, residential then? People always ask me, you know, which baby would you choose? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I always say it's, it's like I only have the one child, so I choose him every single time. But um, you, you can never pick a favourite. Yes. And the reason I can't is because they're so different. But residential will always be your bread and butter. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always going to be a demand for that. Um, and even if the profile of tenant changes or the rental is, you know, reduced as a result of changing different uh, profiles of tenants or something changes within that area, you're always going to have, if you've purchased in the right area, yes. you've done your research correctly, you're always going to be able to rent that property out. Um, and the turnover of tenants is less, um, sorry, higher, but um, they that you can find them quicker. Yes. With commercial, um, uh, uh, and it's still quite hands-on, isn't it? Even if it's outsourced, you know, ultimately. You're still, uh, managing, you're still the managing agent. Man yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's never passive. And I, I you know, I don't like that word at all. Um, ultimately, as the business owner and, and, and it's your portfolio, it's in your interest to yes. make sure that they're doing their job correctly. And so ultimately, you will have the last say and you do have to have that conversation and keep checking. So it's not lying on the beach and collecting yes. you, <laughs> your millions like people think. Um, um, uh, and um, but with so there's, it's quite hands on. There's you know a lot of legislation and things like that. It's forever changing as well. Um, you know if I'd have changed, if I'd have stopped being a landlord um, the first time we saw any changes, I'd have been out the first yes. year. Yes. <laughs> you know it's pretty constantly it, changing. yeah constantly yeah. changing. So you've always got to obviously keep up to date, and there's a massive responsibility there. Same with commercial. You still got a massive responsibility, um, but with commercial, I find it. Um, less hands-on. Yes. Um, so uh, as long as you protect your downside, and again, another reason I focus on listed buildings, especially with commercial, mm -hmm. is because there's no business rates, which can be a huge burden to you as a commercial yeah, landlord. Because longer voids. Are... Yeah, because the voids do tend to be longer, and it does take longer to find, you know, the the correct business yes. and the right tenant to occupy that property. Um, uh, but then they do stay longer. And it's predominantly on an FRI lease. Um, yes. So it's completely hands off. Meaning that the tenant's responsible for well, everything, the day to day yeah. maintenance and yeah. upkeep of the property. Yeah. So it's more closer to the passive as opposed to passive. It, it is. I would say commercial is much more passive. Yes. Um, uh, it, but it is a completely different model. Yes. Um, there's no right or wrong way. I like both. Yeah, and it's, so, a, it's good to spread your risk, isn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I guess just like residential, you'll get some people that will invest because they're parking funds yes. and it's just growing yeah. the capital over the long term yeah. or producing a, a certain level of income. And others will look to see how they can roll up their sleeve, improve the value of the property, such as the commercial asset management you're talking about, where yeah. in, uh, improve the amount of income that building's generating yeah. uh, and uh, increase its value. He's still basically doing the same thing by renovate, rent, refinance. Yes, it's yes. just in a commercial aspect. Um, so, yeah. And you've transitioned to, as we were talking earlier, into much more kind of complex and unusual buildings and properties. So what, what other type of uh, projects are you working on at the moment? Um, so majority of the stuff are commercial conversions or commercial asset management at the moment. Yes. Um, I've recently done a car park okay. um, and doing a shopping centre as yes. well. Uh, so that's new. Um, uh, so, yeah, I've got my fingers in a lot of pies, but they're all 
they you know they're all very similar uh, yes. you know the the car park for example that came with a commercial building um and a lot of land at the side um most people actually looked at that as development but i knew that you wouldn't get um planning yes. permission to develop that plot of land so i looked at well, what does the area need and it needed parking um uh, so i got permission for it to be a pain display car park right um and that's a free plot of land because there's parking to the building anyway yes. uh, and i make about six thousand pounds a month wow. profit yeah it's completely hands off car parking. um yeah so if anyone watching uh, knows any good plots of land <laughs> in good locations yes. I, I mean parking is definitely you know i am looking at parking as, yes. as as an investment it's not just about property it's about business and it's if yes. you can identify that something's missing you can buy at the right price and you can make money out of it then uh, you know, people say to me, what are you focusing on? And I say, well, whatever's going to make me money. Yes. You know, whatever you pitch to me, as long as I can see that it's a good viable asset and we're going to make some money out of it, then I'll invest in it. Yes. You know, I'm not precious about what, what I focus on. Yes, I love that. We were speaking earlier off camera about property really is a business and yeah. sometimes people don't see it in that way. And you you have to have the uh, the, the the fundamental business acumen yes. and just apply it to the scenario of property. That's all it is. So you're always looking for opportunities and angles. Yeah. And some of the things that you're doing, it they're, they're niches that you maybe never have considered or explored beforehand. It just happens to come along your way and you, you've started looking at it. There's a huge amount of learning each time because you're venturing into something new. Yeah. So how do you cope with that, manage that? Because you're, you're constantly then learning new things all the time. Yeah, I think that's what I love about property uh, and business. Yes. Um, you know, every property or business that I invest in um, teaches me something new. And um, I I just love growing as an individual. You know, everything that I, every problem I solve, every lesson I learn, yes. um, I just feel better, stronger and uh satisfied. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I've stayed in property as long as I have. Um, because there is always something new to learn. Yes. I would never sit here and say I know everything. You know, there's always something new to learn. There's always a problem I haven't come across. There's always an issue that I have to solve that's new. Um, so even if it's the same type of projects, there's always something unique about that particular project. And, you know, it might be a relationship that, you know, has broken down and I can learn from that. It might be, you know, an enforcement that I've struggled to get removed and I'm, yes. you know, gone over a bridging loan or whatever, <laughs> you know, if financially there might be a lesson there learned um so i just love growing me as an individual and I, I you know i don't watch tv or anything like that i'm very much um focused now on picking projects where i will grow so i'm not afraid to learn something new mm -hmm. i think um if you're prepared to put the legwork in you're prepared to do the homework and you're prepared to learn something new um, and become an expert in that particular arena or to be able to answer the questions to solve the problems, you'll always make money. Yes. Um, and I think that's why I do as well as I do, um, because I'm, you know, I'm not lazy. Mm. I don't stick to what I know. I look at the opportunity and if that opportunity presents a good, solid, viable deal, I'll know everything about that. Yes. And I'm prepared to put the work in to, to, to do that. And I have the people around me to be able to support that as well. I guess most people, when they're learning something new, they'll take that knowledge and test it with something small. Yeah. Um, but you'll jump in with a shopping centre. <laughs> So tell yeah, us but about I haven't just jumped. Something... I haven't just jumped. I, I, in with I'm, a... uh, I'm teasing a little bit. So, <laughs> so tell us how that how that came about. Yeah. So um, you know, at the end of the day, um, the deals just end up getting bigger. The numbers just add zeros on the end. Um, it's still broken down the same as it would be. Uh, yes. You know, uh, one shop. Um, so and it's it 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 it's just about you know moving forward. Um, I don't remember ever being comfortable. And I think that's because um, when I'm, f not that I have a problem with being comfortable, I do, but I feel that if I'm in a position where I'm not pushing myself, I'm not growing as an individual. Yes. So it's the knowledge that pulls me forward um, and I'm only going to get better at what I do by challenging myself. Yes. So um, if it's one shop and I'm valuing it and assessing the the you know the opportunity, it's no different. It's mm -hmm. just broken down. 
Um, so I haven't just jumped into a shopping centre or a museum or a car park or, yes. you know, a, a factory um, and, and a school and all of the other things I do. I've slowly progressed to those levels. Um, people say or see me now and they think that I'm an, you know, they see me as an overnight success. Um, but actually, it took 22 years to get to where I am today to have the confidence that I do, the people in my little black book that I do, the relationships that I have and the people that I have around me. That's took a lot of kissing frogs yes. to get to the prince. <laughs> Find the such. right people to yeah, build that absolutely. network. And that network is super important. Massive. And I think people sometimes underestimate the importance of the right people around you and the circle of people that you have. Uh, you also uh, run a networking event as well for, for uh, women only. So I haven't been able to attend that. So tell us, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about how that's come about and why you've started a, a networking event. So, um, I mean, the reason I started, um, it, it kind of started with us. Uh, I'd wanted to been doing something for women for a, a long time. I, I, of course, do my training organisation and I get a lot of women that come to me as someone that they look up to yes. uh, in the industry and, you know, and, and, and steps ahead of where they want to be um, and doing what they want to do. So I've always had that connection um, uh, with with women and, and um, always wanted to kind of nurture not more so than men. I, yes. I teach lots of men as well, and predominantly probably men, which is probably why I, I you know, I did feel that bringing something for mm. women would be a good idea. Um, so we have um, Elevate Her, which is our female um, training. Um, but I wanted to create a community. Mm -hmm. um, so quite often uh, when I first started out, uh, there wasn't many women at all. Yes. And if they were, they were in finance, sales and lettings, yes. or, or predominantly lettings and management um, uh, or staging. Mm. You know, there wasn't many women on site, you know, um, project managing and things like that. Um, so it was a very male dominated industry and, and still is to a certain extent. Um, but I never really... Uh, although I had several experiences which were, you know, unforgivable and, and I learned a lot of lessons out just being a woman in the industry, I always felt like I had to work harder, be better yes. and show up 10 times more than any guy um, that I was, you, you know, mm. working with um, just to get the same recognition. And and that's not great. You know, no. that's not good as a society. And um, so what I wanted to do was... Um, build confidence in women that are just starting out. And because I am a strong woman and I've been in the industry so long and I've gone through all of these experiences, I kind of forgot how hard it mm. was to start yes. as a young woman in this industry. And I put an apology out on to, you know, I've always kind of said, this is not a man's world. Um, property is my world. It's what I do every single day. And I yes. surround myself with people um, that don't recognize me as a woman. They recognize me as a good, solid business yes. person. Um, and they respect me as an individual. But that wasn't always the case mm. and quite often I, I you know when i did first start out there was um definitely um you know bias to uh, 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 and 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 uncomfortable situations sexual harassment and all things mm. like that of which you you know being a young woman in the industry and i think you know if 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 those feelings are so far away and time enough time passes you forget the yes. pain yes. um and then i was in a situation when i was in a new circle um, and um, not many people knew who I was. And I, I felt that feeling again, and it okay. all came rushing back to me. Right. And I was kind of like, wow, mm. I thought that we'd, uh, you know, I'd just been okay. surrounded by okay. good, solid people for so long. I didn't yes. realize it was still going on. Um, so um, at that point then I kind of thought, is it still around you know uh, 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 is it just that i have surrounded myself with the right people but actually it is challenging for many women that are out there yes. um so i wanted to then create this uh, community and i was in the bar with a couple of ladies they just watched me do um uh, a property elevator live show in london um and they'd heard about my journey and things like that and they wanted to do a networking event as well and i said well i'm setting up a female yes. networking event why don't you come and do it with me um and what we wanted to do was create a good, solid, um, supportive community solely for women. And the reason we wanted to do that is not to compete with men or just to be 
you know, one-sided towards women. It was to build up their confidence and give them a platform to build that confidence up, yes. having the support so that they could go out into the world, which is male dominated and have the confidence to be able to just be themselves. Um, and that's why we connect with so many different networking events. Yes. It's not about just female, we're not anti-men at all. Yes. Majority of the people I work with are men mm. because I've worked with them for such a long yes. time. It was very male dominated when I first started out and I still work with those people today um, just because they are the people that I've been working with for such a long time. So not only was it about that, it was also I needed that female mm. energy as well. You know, um, I, I am predominantly surrounded by men. The majority of the people I do work with are men. Um, and have been for a very long time and I wanted to surround myself with good solid women um, and uh, and that's the that that's the space we've created. Yes. Um, it's still very male dominated uh, the, the industry and uh, if I think back to when I first started attending networking events and meeting people most of the people you'd meet would be would, would be, be men, men. Yeah. and there's way more females now yeah. in this space which i think is a fantastic thing and even at our networking events and our trains probably about a third female and maybe two-thirds uh male um and i, I think uh we, we want to surround ourselves by the best person for the role but if somebody hasn't been given the opportunity to present their skills or their ability they won't uh, progress so uh, i think it's uh, what you're doing is fantastic it's just about building building relationships, um, building confidence. Um, so we give the women a platform to be able to stand up yes. and have the confidence, say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I've done this week. Yes. This is my win, you know, and having that support around them and the energy when it's just women. Yeah, and I guess it's probably the same when it's just men. I'd, I don't know. Um, I don't think I'd get away with running a male-only network. I, think, and I was saying not? this to you the other day. It, I don't think you know, it would work. It, what's good for one is good for the other. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, it, it was more about just surrounding ourselves with good, solid women, being able to help and support them. Yes. Um, you know, we don't make money out of the network and it's more yes. of a a supportive community yeah. than anything else connecting but also yes. me surrounding myself yeah. by good solid women as well and and learning and growing with with them giving them a platform to you know promote themselves off um, we give them opportunity to speak and yes. and there's a lot of business that's done in the room and the conversation and energy is just so much different and prior to actually running our female networking event I'd never been to all female yes. networking event um I'm a confident, successful woman that, um, you know, has grown with confidence over time. That didn't just happen. Um, but I'm confident in what I do and I'm confident in, you know, who I am. And I can enter any room, whether it's men, women, and and, and know that I'm worthy to be there. Yes. You know, I, I don't question my ability. I don't need to. Um, and I don't work with people that do. You know, at the end of the day, they either accept me for who I am, whether that's male or female or whatever I identify myself as. It makes yes. no difference at all. Um, I have that confidence, but not many women do. Yes. And I think being able to um, give them a platform in a smaller environment where they've got good, solid women around them. We answer their questions. It's supportive. We give them the opportunity to have a platform to build their confidence, to then go out to, you know, your networking event, but also perhaps see me there or Jeannie there yes. or Penny there or Melissa or any of the other wonderful ladies, some phenomenal women that attend our event from all over the UK and also, you know, flying from Scotland, Belgium and, and, and the likes of Ireland um, just to attend our events because yes. it's such a good, solid energy and it, it is different. So it's not competitive. I would never say go to an all male, uh, all female networking event and don't bother going to your other networking events. They're, it's different altogether. It's, it's, yes. it's, it is. I think getting out to as many networking events is important. It certainly helped massively in my yeah. property investing journey. Yeah, and you have a fabulous, you know, networking event, and I, I was absolutely. You can come again. Thank uh, you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will come again. <laughs> you mentioned property elevator earlier on. For those yeah. that are not familiar with that, so tell us briefly about what property elevator is first of all. So Property Elevator is a TV show. Um, I've been with the show now for two seasons. Uh, this is its seven uh, series. Um, and uh, it's uh, basically a panel of angels where you pitch your deals for investment. 
Uh, so, um, you know, if you're looking for funding for a similar deal... format to like a Dragon's Den yes. style. Yes. Yeah, very, very similar. So we even filmed in the Dragon's Den studio, so yeah. which was super <laughs> fun. And uh, yeah, very, very good uh, week of filming there. Uh, but basically, people that are, have found a good viable deal, um, uh, they perhaps don't have the experience or uh, all the money. Um, or both yes. and they pitch to a panel of angels which I'm one of the angels so I'm um, the only female on the panel and then you've got the likes of John Howard, Paul uh, Mahoney, Nicholas Woolwork, Ranjan Bharacharya and then of course our lender which is Scott Marshall with Roma yes. Finance. Um, so um, they pitch their deals and we, do, we ask questions and we decide whether we want to invest in their deals or not. And uh, what's been uh, the most interesting deal you've had pitched at you uh, on the show? Um, so this series or last? Uh, whichever you are able to share. Uh, I'm not so... sure if you can share all the things on this series just yet because it's not been aired yet. I mean, all of them come with their weird and wonderful and different people. And we buy yes. into the people more than yes. anything else. That's what quite, I wanted to get at. It's, yeah, it's often quite people, often, you know, the deals... Um, quite often the deals actually don't stack up when mm -hmm. when we come to do the due diligence we start negotiating yes. and we start liaising with the team or the people that they've been negotiating with um we can't you know we we can't do that or or there's yes. an issue here that actually can't be solved or actually just makes the deal not viable yes. um but we buy into the people more than anything else so ongoing deals will happen um if the initial deal that's pitched actually doesn't mm -hmm. um you know stack up uh, I think the most interesting one um, I had was actually last series um, and uh, it was um, a plot of land uh, that had uh, um, planning permission to build a, uh, a, a travel lodge. Okay. And they got contacts with the travel lodge right. that wanted to, you know, um, uh, uh, take on this property once it was completed, etc. So they've yes. got that. That was super interesting. However, the although I offered on that deal, and um, and that was, you know, the the pack was fabulous, superb. Uh, the research behind it. I mean, I love serviced accommodation yeah. and hotel data and things like that. That's my background. Yes. You know. And so um, the information that was presented, it was the best pack I'd ever seen. Uh, but the plot of land wasn't for sale. And uh, the, the, the owner of the land was a little bit miffed that. I... <laughs> oh, wow. So this is speculative <laughs> so, as opposed to. Uh... Yeah. So it wow. was kind of like a hope project okay. um, that, that I offered on. Um, but that was a I think it was a 12 million pound project. Right. Um, it would if we could have got it forward funded uh, yes. because of the strength of the tenant that it, that that was uh, looking to to take on this building. It would have been a great deal, um, but the the plot of land was never for sale, <laughs> unfortunately. So sometimes things yes. like that happen. It's a great deal. Yeah. You want to get it over the line. You've got the funding lined up, and it it would be a a, a good viable deal and makes you know sense. Um, great solid person, but then yes. perhaps not you know. Yes not delivered in the sense that actually that plot of land is not for sale. Yeah, one thing on the uh, uh, program that you've seen as, as somebody that's come up pitching for investment that you you thought never in a million years am I going to touch that? Um, I tend to stay away from anything that's um, not a standard construction basically okay. yeah. um so um i you know i find it really difficult to get exit lending and things like yes. that and to to uh so any weird and wonderful things with modular homes and things mm. like that i'd stay away from it's a safe exit that's important it's the exit that's the most important part yes. you, you you know you start with the end in mind yes. uh, your exit is the first thing you think about <laughs> and then you work backwards um so um yeah absolutely you know uh, creative things like that while there's a place for it mm -hmm. um and um i'm sure we'll end up there in the future yes. it, it's just not a viable exit at this moment in time and I, so I, I would never invest in anything like that yeah and i think um even when somebody's purchasing something like that for themselves even if they're not planning to sell it's important to be thinking about an exit because at some yeah. point if they do decide to sell it needs to be viable for somebody else to buy absolutely i mean regardless of your intention you should always buy with a view to sell 
Yes. Um, so if there's a problem with that property and you might be OK with that problem, you still have to solve the problem. Yes. Because ultimately, if you do have to sell at any point in the future, whether that was your intention or not, you have to have a buyer. <laughs> and if they're going to inherit a problem or they can't get a mortgage or there's an issue there or there's no audience, then yes. you have a problem. Yes. Um, Hayley, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, and appreciate you taking your time to, to come and see us. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Um, so the best way is just to find me on LinkedIn, okay. Hayley Andrews. Um, we can chat on there. I put stuff out all the time. So Excellent. We'll put that on the screen and also in the description as well. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah.